Hi everybody, welcome to the fifth video lecture where the topic is musculoskeletal geometry. One of my favorite topics in this class. So we finally have made it out of this first block of this famous flowchart diagram. So we spent a fair amount of time understanding the transformation from EMG to muscle force and we've talked about lots of things that influence muscle force uh, all the way from activated activation dynamics all the way on to muscle architecture, force length, force velocity, all this stuff. So theoretically at this point, uh, if you, you're given enough information, you should be able to calculate what a muscle's force is. All right, so what's the next step? Because we know muscles don't just generate force and move us, they generate movement by acting upon our skeleton. And in thinking about that process mechanically, what that it's doing is transforming a muscle force to a joint moment, which ultimately results in the observed movement. So the main topic of today is what are the main topics of today are as follows. We're going to define what we call a moment arm, which we've alluded to a couple times in the class already. I'm going to give you a formal definition. Then we're going to talk about the relationship between moment arm and muscle tendon length change. So it ends up being critical. Uh, we'll also talk about the influence of moment arm on velocity, and then we'll sum up to look at what this looks like at the whole joint level. All right, so the definition of a moment arm. The simplest way to put it, I'd say, is the perpendicular distance from the joint center to the line of action of the muscle. So here our joint center is O. Uh, we've got our uh, insertion point of the muscle which is P1 and then this red thing here is a muscle where the vector uh, that's going pointing from P1 towards P2 is a vector F which denotes the muscle force where here the uh, the force is wrapped up into a whole vector denoting the orientation of the vector and the magnitude so the magnitude of F would be the muscle force um, but then, of course, it's a vector because it's pointed in a particular direction and, 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 and coming from a particular uh, point, P1. So the moment arm is a geometric quantity that just tells you what is the distance between the origin to this line of action or this vector. So obviously, the closer the muscle path is to the joint center, the smaller the moment arm, and the further away from it, from the joint center of the bigger moment arm. Also uh, make note of the coordinate system here uh, where X coordinate system is pointing out of the page and now thinking about how we're, if we're thinking about rotation of the ankle flexion extension here then the rotation of that type of movement would be X i.e. out of the plane um, and Y and Z would be in the plane. So if we're interested in the, the muscle moment that's generated um, in the plane that has to do with the flexion extension of the ankle, we'd be dealing with the X uh, rotation. So now thinking in general, the moment that a muscle would generate about a given uh, point O would be R, which is the vector, which is a vector pointing from the origin to a point here of the, the application of the force, where here we're using P1 cross with F. So this should be something that you remember from physics, uh, from your uh, statics class, and or from your biomechanics class. So simple definition of moment arm that we're dating ourselves now back to something that you should have seen before. Moment is R cross F. Now we're, these are all vectors. Uh, make note of that. So um, now um, referring to what I mentioned before, let's say we're interested in the component of this moment that's in the x direction. So of course this is going to be a three-dimensional vector here with an x, a y, and a z component. Now let's uh, break that out into the component in the x direction. So that would be the part of the, the um, part of the moment that's generating a moment about the x-axis, which is the what we're interested in here. And that would just be r cross f dotted with x. So taking the x component by taking a dot product with the x vector. So now, as you can see, mfx is a scalar quantity. So that's just a scalar moment 
because it's um, just one of the three elements of the moment vector, and that's just the one in the x direction, which is the what we call degree of freedom that we're interested in here. So we're going to define moment arm as essentially this, mx, divided by the magnitude of f. So right now, what you're getting here is the total summed, um, or the total moment um, about the x direction. But now if we, and so that's not just purely a geometric thing because it um, wraps into it the magnitude of the force that the muscle is generating. But let's say that we're interested in just the geometrical aspect. So we don't want our calculation of the moment arm to be sensitive to what the fuscle, muscle force is. We want to normalize that out. So here, this is what we call moment arm would be r cross f divided with x now divided by the magnitude of f. So remember, magnitude of a vector is just the um, uh, is just a scalar quantity. Um, you should remember square sum of the squares square rooted. Um, so hopefully you're remembering a little bit of your vector algebra here. Um, but that's what the uh, moment arm definition is. And so as you note. Know, moment arm is a scalar quantity here. And if, it, if you work it out, if you do the geometry here, this, um, the resultant of this calculation would be exactly the perpendicular distance. So if you make sure this line is perpendicular to your force line, uh, that's what you would get here. So that's what the moment arm is. So now if we're interested in just a scalar relationship, we're calculating the moment um, about x of um, from an applied force of the muscle, just being the magnitude of the muscle force here, the scalar quantity, um, times the moment arm. So this is both, both scalars. And if you can think about it, if you just if you already knew the moment arm of a muscle, you've already given it, then all you then to calculate the muscle force, this is just a scalar quantity. So this is just going to depend on the length and the velocity and the intrinsic architecture parameters and all that kind of stuff that we've talked about. So the nice thing about defining the moment arm is now you don't have to, whenever you're doing these moment calculations, you don't have to keep track of all these, ge all these um, points and vectors and everything. You just need to know the moment arm. Once you know the moment arm, you just multiply that by the force in the muscle and you've got the moment. So it's really a useful way to describe the muscle um, geometry. All right, so um, that's the first main definition. So there's a set, another way to calculate a moment arm that um, stems from exactly this definition, and I'm going to describe it here. And um, the reason why I want to describe moment arm in two ways is they end up mathematically end up being equivalent, and I'll show you how the derivation works. But both of them come into play in our description and interpretation of what a moment arm is. And the second way to look at a moment arm would be through what we call the principle of virtual work. So now looking at a muscle here that might be at the arm. So we've got our muscle. Um, we've got our perpendicular distance with the moment arm. And then we're defining our joint angle here. And then this LMT is the length of the entire muscle tendon unit. As you can see, it goes from origin to insertion. So the principle of virtual work here is looking at uh, what the virtual work would be over a virtual displacement um, or angular displacement of some kind. So virtual work here would be the muscle force, which is equivalent now, I've, is just a scalar quantity, which is the muscle force, i.e. the magnitude of that force vector from before. It's just muscle force times moment arm, so that's moment, times uh, the virtual angular displacement. Uh, similarly, you can define the virtual work as just the force in the muscle times the length displacement, delta LMT. So those um, both can define the virtual work within a, uh, that a muscle will do um, at a joint. So those are both virtual work. You can set those equal to each other. So I've just set this one equal to this one, and you end up with this relationship. And if you cross out the Fs, uh, and you rearrange it, you'll get moment arm is uh, uh, the virtual length change divided by the virtual um, uh, angle change. And then if you take that and you make your virtual change go to zero, then this ends up looking like a derivative. 
So that means, i.e., the moment arm of the muscle is equal to the derivative of the change in the length of the muscle tendon unit with respect to joint angle. So it may not seem obvious to you how this comes about. Hopefully, mathematically, it makes a little bit of sense. Um, those of you mechanical engineers should, should have seen some discussion of virtual work in your dynamics course. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if the BMEs have seen it, but you might have seen it at some point in, uh, in physics, but at least have been defined work in a couple different ways. Uh, but here, this is how we're defining it. And uh, through this definition, these derivations, this is, this is true. Moment arm defined exactly how we defined it before, perpendicular distance from uh, joint center to uh, muscle path. Um, is equal to the change in length with joint angle. So the reason why um, in biomechanics we've come through this derivation is it ends up being a useful way to measure, well, for two reasons. It's a useful way to measure muscle moment arm, and it's also um, it helps us understand the influence of moment arm on the muscle function. So I'm going to go through first how it ends up uh, helping us calculate moment arm. And that's what we call the tendon displacement method. So if you were to take an arm here, so this is a cadaver arm that um, Wendy Murray did this um, measurement um, now a couple decades ago, still um, experimental data that's uh, being used today. Uh, you, so this is the biceps muscle that's been exposed by dissection and if you, um, if you attach a cable to the proximal part of the muscle here, this part, and route it through its origin, and attach that to position transducer, what you've done here is you've taken the muscle and enabled you to measure how much it changes length uh, as the angle, as you move the elbow through a range of motion. So as you move the elbow, um, doing an OD here, and then you measure through your position transducer how much your muscle changes length, you can use that to make your calculation of moment arm. And you can do that at a lot of points. So here's an example of what that might look like. So again, here's the description of the arm muscle. Here's the length of the muscle tendon unit. You've got your angle here. And we're going to here now plot out what you would get potentially from your position transducer. So this would be the length of the muscle tendon unit, and this would be the joint angle. So um, at one particular point you get one length, and as you move, as you move the joint here, uh, you're going to get, um, and since we've defined the joint angle this way, as you increase the joint angle, that would be the elbow extending, then the length of the muscle tendon unit gets longer because the whole muscle is getting longer. Um, and this is just really all geometrical here because um, this is not, don't worry right now that this is active or passive and the tendon is stretching, not tendon is stretching because you're summing up what the muscle plus the tendon looks like. So this is really um, defined based on the geometrical features of the muscle, its attachments and, um, and wrapping and all that sort of stuff. So this would be uh, different measurements that you would take. So now, um, and then you can use this moment arm is, is um, dl d theta, I'm going to call it. And here, what I've shown here, I've changed what it looks like just slightly. Instead of a partial derivative that I used before, I'm using just the delta sign, which is implying now we're going to do some sort of numerical change. So this would be the change in length with respect to the change in joint angle. So delta is... Uh, now showing that we're going to do this numerically. And I've also um, highlighted the fact that this should be in radians. And so if you were paying close attention to my derivation from the principle of virtual work, you would have noted that in order for those, those equations to work out, theta would have to be in radians. It couldn't be in degrees or you would, be, you would, have, a, you would have a unit mismatch. So this is absolutely critical. Theta has to be in radians in order to do this calculation. So always remember that. 
Um, if you leave it in degrees, you're going to get numbers that are astronomically wrong. So theta and radians, always check that. So let's walk through a quick example here. Um, I'm going to use my pen to see, show you what we're going to do. So um, we have uh, moment arm change and joint angle. So here's some example uh, data points that we might get at a, uh, various joint angles, theta. And then here are the measurements we might get of lengths at each of these different joint angles. So now let's see. OK, let's start calculating things from here. And we're going to do a numerical derivative here. Um, and I'm going to use what we call central differences, um, which is uh, one, a simple way to do a numerical derivative. And I think maybe at least the BMEs have been exposed to numerical derivatives uh, in their computational BME class. So this should be dusting off some cobwebs. So, but I'll show them here. So I'm going to use central differences and I'm going to look between, so in here you look between numbers and you look at your, and you assume your values that you get from your derivative is the dead center between them. So here um, we're going to do theta in between these two is 30. And then so delta theta and radians, I'm going to estimate that 30 degrees is about 0 0.5. So, um, and so here the numbers that I'm calculating are for 45 degrees. So at 45 degrees, I'm doing all these, these changes in derivatives. And in order to do that, I'm going to be looking before and after the 45 degrees. So the change in joint angle at this point, based on this, um, is 30. And then uh, so that in radians is 0.5. So then the change in length is 1. And then the moment arm is change in length with respect to joint angle. So change in length is 1 divided by change in joint angle and radians 0.5. So you end up with 2. So now let's do the same thing here. So uh, 75 degrees. Uh, our delta theta is 30, again 0.5. Now our dl is 2, it's a little bigger, so that makes a moment arm is 4. Now let's look at 105, we're going to be, again, d theta is 30.5. Now here, the difference here is 3, so now our moment arm is 6. So now let's look at 135. We're still, d theta is 30.5. Now our change is 2 again. And so moment arm is 4. And now at 165, our d theta is 30, 0 0.5. Now it's 1, so now we're back down to 2. So moment arm was goes small to big to small, which is pretty common. Uh, moment arms often, or for the most part, always change with joint angle because the path moves. Um, and here's an example. It's a very simple example, so quite symmetric, and the numbers are nice um, because we're looking at by hand. So here's what that'll look like. Now if we replot it out, moment arm here versus joint angle. And as you can see, I'm putting these numbers um, as you remember, the first, uh, oops, the first angle was 45, and then I think I was at 75, 105, 135, 175. So this is central differences. So if you don't remember or never seen how to do numerical derivatives, look up numerical derivatives on Google. You can say numerical derivatives, central differences, and that should explain it a little bit more for you. And probably dust off some cobwebs. I'm sure you've seen that in some form before, and it should be somewhat intuitive, but um, that's what I've done here. All right, uh, the other uh, next point I wanted to make and concepts here is moment arms influence velocity too. So let's look at how that comes out mathematically. So again, starting with uh, moment arm is dld theta. And so you should become very soon, hopefully very familiar with just saying that. Moment arm is dld theta. DLD theta is moment arms. I have a, had a friend from grad school who studied moment arms a lot um, in her PhD, and she would say that she wanted to name her children DL and D theta. 
um, because of this equation. So just think of that, dl and d theta, your two kids. All right, so let's just multiply both sides of that equation by d theta dt, so um, angular velocity. So we're going to multiply the left side and the right side by d theta dt. Uh, and then you'll see that you get d thetas canceling out. So you end up with d lmt dt is moment arm d theta dt. Right? And d lmt dt is just the velocity of the muscle tendon unit is equal to the moment arm times d theta dt. So what that means is for a given angular velocity of the joint, muscles that have bigger moment arms will have a faster muscular tendon velocity. Um, so if you think about what the impl functional implication of that is, uh, you know, we're dealing with the force velocity curve here. So for the same joint angular velocity, muscles that have bigger moment arms will end up further out here because their VM will be bigger. So muscles with the bigger moment arms will be here and muscles with the smaller moment arms will be back here smaller moment arms will have slower angular velocities, so um, they will be closer here. So um, in some senses, the bigger moment arms may be bad because they end up with fast, faster speeds. All right, um, now thinking about how this plays out at the joint level. Well, one thing I alluded to before was that moment arms are not constant as joint angles change because um, just in this simple illustration shows as the path as the muscle move or the joint moves, the path of the muscle will change. So, um, as for example, in this case, as the L, as the two segments get closer to each other, the distance from the muscle path to the joint center gets bigger. Um, and for different muscles, this plays out quite differently. Um, but overall, the muscle moment arm will change with joint angle. Then, okay, now let's think about this at the whole muscle level. So we already know that because as the joint changes, the muscle length change, the muscle length changes, then of course the force will change because force is dependent on length. So here's a theoretical thing, a normalized value here is just normalized force at this point as a function of joint angle. So um, we know the force will not be constant because the length is changing due to the force length relationship. And then I just told you that the moment arm also will change with joint angle. And so each of those will likely have some sort of increase and decrease and a peak. And so, but the peak force of a muscle and its peak moment arm won't necessarily be at the same joint angle. So now uh, the moment generated by that muscle um, would be the product of the force and the moment arm at each joint angle. So at each particular joint angle, uh, the moment would be the product of those two. And, um, and so that's going to be its own curve with its own peak. And then of course we have multiple muscles at each given joint. So if you add muscle A, muscle B, and muscle C, their joint moments, then you get this total curve that has its own shape and its own peak because it's the summation of all these other curves. So that's something I think you just need to be um, aware of. We have uh, both force and moment arm varying with joint angle and the moment is a product of those two and then the total joint moment is the sum of multiple muscles that each have their own force and moment arm uh, curves with joint angle. Alright, so that finishes our lecture.